Hello and welcome back to Animal Farm. In this third video, we are going to learn four chapters. Chapter 4, 5, 6 and 7. In the last video, we have seen how the pigs established their power in the animal farm and all the animals were forced to obey them or rather uh, give them more uh, privileges because they feared that Mr. Johns may come back. So let's have a look at chapter 4. It's late summer and half of England knows about Animal Farm by now. And Snowball and Napoleon, they send out pigeons uh, to spread word to other animals in other farms and uh, teach them Beasts of England, the song. While Mr. Johns sits in a bar in Billingdon and he complains about his fate. The other farmers, they are sympathizing, but they refuse to help. Actually, they all want to make his misfortune work for them. Luckily for the animals, the owners of the two neighboring farms that are uh, Foxwood and Pinchfield. These are the two neighboring farms. The owners are... Uh, the gentlemanly Mr. Pilkington, he owns the Foxwood and Mr. Frederick is a shrewd man, he owns the Pinchfield. They hate each other too much to agree on anything, even if it's their best interest. Despite this, they are terrified of what happened on the animal farm. Mr. Pilkington and Mr. Frederick try to keep their animals in the da dark about what happened there and insist on continuing to call it the manor farm. They actually do not even mention the um, animal farm as animal farm. None of the rumors that Mr. Frederick or Mr. Pilkington uh, spread about animal farm, however, land well with their animals. The animals had some idea what was happening. Uh, over the next year, animals that were once easygoing begin to act out and the humans cannot stop their animals from singing Beasts of England. So the animals in the other farms, they are also singing Beasts of England. In October, pigeons arrive with the news that Mr. Johns and the men from Foxwood and Pinchfield are coming up the driveway to retake the farm. Mr. Johns has a gun. Snowball is prepared and sends animals to their posts. First, the pigeons and the geese dive bomb and harass the man. Then, Muriel, Benjamin and the sheep converge to button kick them. The men are too strong. So, at Snowball's signal, the animals race into the barnyard. To to the men, this looks like a retreat. So they rush after the animals. So all the animals, they go to the barnyard and the men actually follow them, thinking that the animals are retreating. In the yard, however, the horses, cows and the pigs charge. They attack these men. Mr. Jones shoots at Snowball but only grazes his back. Snowball flattens Mr. Jones as boxer strikes at men with his front hooves. Even the cat leaps on a man. We have seen that the cat was a little bit lazy. And the animals send the men raising for the main gate. Boxer, however, mournfully paws at a stable boy who appears to be dead and insists that he didn't mean to kill anyone. Actually, it was an accident uh, and he was guilty about it. Snowball insists that Boxer was right to kill the boy. He is better off dead. The animals realize that Molly, the hose, she was missing all the time and find her hiding in her stall, terrified of the gun. When the animals return to the barnyard, they discover that the stable boy wasn't dead and he ran off. Nerves give way to excitement and a celebration of their victory. They run up to the flag and sing Beasts of England and they bury the one sheep who
who died in the battle. Snowball gives the speech. He gives a speech emphasizing that animals must be willing to die for Animal Farm. And the animals create the honor of Animal Hero First Class, which they give to Snowball. They also give the deceased sheep the honor of Animal Hero Second Class. Together, the animals decide to call this conflict the Battle of the Cowshed. And when they find Mr. Johnson's gun, they decide to set it up and fire it twice per year on the anniversaries of the battle and the rebellion. That is on October 12th and Midsummer night, Midsummer's Day. So this particular chapter is on Battle of Cowshed, uh, during which the animals resisted or defended their farm uh, from uh, being taken by uh, the uh, owner. So we will move on to the next chapter which, which is chapter 5 which is more about uh, the windmill the animals desire to build. As winter approaches, Molly becomes more difficult to deal with. She is often late for work and complaints but she spends most of her time gazing at her reflection in the drinking pool. One day, Clover takes Molly aside and quietly asks if she really saw Molly al uh, allowing a man from Foxwood to pet her nose. So, uh, Clover had seen Molly allowing a man to pet her nose. Molly denies this accusation, but she can't look Clover into her eyes. Uh, Clo uh, she doesn't, doesn't look into uh, Clover's eyes. Secretly, Clover goes to Molly's stall and discovers a stash of sugar and ribbons, which uh, in a way proves that what uh, Clover had thought was right. Molly disappears and after a few weeks, pigeons report that uh, they have seen her in Willingdon happily pulling a dog cart and wearing ribbons. So Molly goes to serve the men. Uh, she is happy in that way. The weather becomes bitterly cold in January, so the animals can't do anything in the fields. They attend many meetings and the pigs plan out the coming season, something the animals accept as natural given how intelligent the pigs are. The other animals still get to ratify the pigs' decisions, however. The system would be perfect, except that Snowball and Napoleon disagree and off on every point. Snowball is better at speaking and convincing animals at meetings. But Napoleon is better at convincing animals individually between meetings. He, especially, he is especially successful with the sheep who begin bleating four legs good, two legs bad in the middle of meetings and especially in the middle of Snowball's speeches. So these, uh, these sheep somehow uh, spoiled the whole uh, speech by uh, speaking in between. Snowball speaks often about farming theory and develops complicated schemes. Napoleon comes up with no ideas of his own but quietly insists that Snowball's schemes are silly. Their biggest dispute, however, is over the windmill. Snowball proposes that they build one on the highest point on the farm as it would be able to give the farm electricity which would then allow the animals to enjoy leisure time, leisure time uh, while machines work for them. It takes Snowball a few weeks to develop the plants in chalk uh, on uh, the smooth floor of the shed. Uh, the other animals can't make sense of the drawing. Actually, uh, Snowball had drawn the whole thing and animals did not get much out of it, uh, but it looks impressive. So everyone visits daily except for Napoleon. Napoleon does visit once, contemplates the plants and then urinates on them. Snowball is upfront that building the windmill will be difficult. They'll have to carry stone, build walls uh, and somehow procure cables. But he insists they can do it. In an, in an year. 
After this, he says, the animals will only have to work three days per week. Napoleon argues that they need to increase their food production and that focusing on the windmill will lead to starvation. The farm is deeply divided over the windmill, but the only animal who doesn't take a side is Benjamin, the donkey. He insists that no matter what happens, life will continue to be awful. The other question that occupies the animals is of the farm's defense. As they all recognize that their conflict with humans isn't over, they expect humans to try in re, uh, to reinstate Mr. Johns. Especially since news of the animal's victory at the Battle of the Cowshed has spread, Napoleon insists that they must train the animals to use firearms. While Snowball proposes, they send out more pigeons to stir up revolution elsewhere. The other animals can't make up their minds and agree with whoever's talking at any given time. So other animals become confused. They do not know whom to support. Snowball finishes his plans for the windmill and brings it to a vote at, a Sunday, at the Sunday meeting. He makes his case logically. Napoleon then stands and says only that the windmill is nonsense and nobody should vote for it. In response, Snowball jumps up, uh, shushes the sheep and passionately explains why they need the windmill. His passion wins over and the animals as he talks about how electricity can operate farming machinery as well as uh, equip stalls with lights, hot and cold water and heat. Just as everyone seemed decided, Napoleon stands, looks at Snowball and whimpers oddly. Suddenly, nine ferocious dogs bound into the barn and chase Snowball all the way through a hedge. The animals realize that these dogs are the nine puppies Napoleon educated. Napoleon stands on the raised platform, surrounded by the dogs. The other animals notice that these dogs wag their tails at Napoleon just like other dogs used to wag at Mr. Jones. Napoleon announces that there will be no more Sunday meetings as they are unnecessary and waste time. Farm policy will be decided by special pig committee that he oversees and the committee will convey the decisions to the others when they all sing Beasts of England. There will be no more debates. The other animals, even Boxer, are dismayed. Four young pigs squeal in disapproval, but the dogs growl and silence them. The sheep bleat, four legs good, two legs bad, and for 15 minutes. Later, Squealer makes the rounds to explain the new rules. He points out that Napoleon is sacrificing himself by taking on the difficult job of leadership. And he must do so because the other animals might make the wrong decisions. Squealer asks where they'd be if they had followed Snowball. But someone points out that Snowball fought bravely at the Battle of the Cowshed. Squealer insists that bravery isn't as important as loyalty and obedience and implies that Snowball's role in the battle was exaggerated. He reminds everyone again that if they are not disciplined, Mr. Johns will return. This convinces the animals entirely. Anything that might help, Mr. Johns must stop. Boxer declares that if Napoleon says it, it must be right. Winter turns into spring and the plowing begins. Every Sunday, the animals gather in the barn to get their orders for the week. Napoleon disinters old major's skull and asks everyone to walk past it reverently. While during meetings, the animals sit separated. Napoleon, Squealer and, the, and a pig named Minimus sit together, surrounded by the nine dogs, while the other pigs sit behind them. The rest of the animals sit in the body of the barn, looking at the pigs. Three weeks after Snowball's departure, Napoleon announces that they'll build the windmill. 
It will take two years and will require everyone's rations to be reduced. Later, Squealer explains privately that Napoleon never opposed the windmill. It had been his idea and Snowball stole his plans. Napoleon only appeared to oppose the windmill to get rid of Snowball, whom he declares is dangerous and a bad influence. Squealer says that this is called tactics, a word that the animals don't understand. Squealer is persuasive and has three dogs with him, so the animals don't ask questions. So we have seen that Napoleon has stolen the plan of Snowball and Snowball is almost banished from the uh, animal farm. Nobody even thinks of him. Uh, he is actually uh, made, he's defamed in a way. Uh, everyone thinks that he was not that heroic and all. Uh, so Napoleon actually emphasizes his power. He makes sure that everyone listens to him. He has... Uh, Squealer, he has minimums. Those pigs actually help him um, in his propaganda. Now we'll move on to the next chapter that is chapter 6. In this chapter, uh, the animals work like slaves that year. So they, they, ha they are already planning to build the windmill, but uh, they are happy, to, uh, happy knowing that humans won't profit from their efforts. So even though they are working really hard, they have a feeling that they are not working for the humans. They work 60 hour weeks through the summer and in August, um, Napoleon announces that they'll work on Sunday afternoons. Sunday used to be a holiday for them. This is voluntary, but animals who don't work Sundays will, be, uh, will see reduced rations. He says that it is voluntary, but... Those who do not work will not get their uh, rations properly. The harvest is less successful this year and uh, the mishaps uh, mean that the animals missed planting certain crops. The winter is um, guaranteed to be difficult. Construction on the windmill uh, proves difficult as well. So everything was not going well. Uh, it was not a good harvest. And windmill construction was also difficult. Um, there's a quarry on the farm and a stash of other building material. But the animals cannot break the rocks in the quarry without standing on their hind legs. They are not, not like humans. They walk on four legs. So uh, without the help of their uh, um, front legs, uh, uh, they, they, they have to stand on their hind legs and break the rock. After a few weeks, the animals begin hauling huge boulders to the top of the quarry and uh, toppling them over the edge of the shatter to shatter. So what they do is that they uh, take up huge boulders, uh, big uh, stones and they will uh, topple, uh, topple them down and they will shatter the rest of the uh, stones. Uh, the hoses, sheep, Muriel and Benjamin all haul stone to the site of the uh, windmill. The process is exhausting. Boxer seems stronger than ever. He single-handedly keeps the other animals from sliding back down the hill. Uh, begins getting up 45 minutes before everyone else to work and carries loads of stone to the windmill alone. He ignores Clover's warning to not to strain himself. The summer is reasonable for the animals. They don't have more food than they had under Mr. John's, but they don't have less. Uh, the animals find that their methods of performing tasks are more efficient than human methods. And since the animals don't steal, they don't have to worry about maintaining fences and hedges. Despite all of this, late in the summer, the animals realize they need things like oil, nails, dog biscuits and horse shoes. Uh, horse shoes. Later they'll need tools, machinery and seeds. Nobody knows how to get these things. On Sunday morning, Napoleon announces that the animal farm will trade with the neighboring farms for the items they need. 
He is going to sell hay, wheat and later possibly eggs. Napoleon tell the hens that they should welcome this sacrifice. The other animals are vaguely uneasy as they remember the seven commandments stating that the animals shouldn't engage in trade or use money. The four young pigs speak up timidly but the growling dogs silence them and the sheep begin bleating. Four legs good, two legs bad. Napoleon explains that the animals won't have to see much of the humans as he has hired a solicitor named Mr. Wimper to deal with their affairs. After the meeting, Squealer sets everyone at ease by telling them privately that they must all be imagining that they can't engage in trade or use money but that this was just a rumor started by Snowball. This is comforting for animals to hear. So, uh, in a way, Squealer succeeds in making those animals believe that uh, the, uh, the trade was actually not allowed for them um, because Snowball had uh, lied to them. So, actually, they can do trade. So, animals somehow felt uh, happy or uh, they were comforted by this feeling. Mr. Wimper visits every Monday. The animals avoid him as much as possible, but they do pridefully watch Napoleon on four legs, giving orders to a two-legged human. Other humans hate Animal Farm more than ever. They all believe that Animal Farm will go bankrupt at some point and that the windmill will fail. But against their will, they do develop a grudging respect for the animal's efficiency. Inside all men, somehow, uh, they have a feeling of respect for them because they are succeeding. Rumor circulates that Napoleon is going to strike a deal with either Mr. Pilkington or Mr. Frederick, but not with both. About this time, the pigs move into the farmhouse. Squealer circulates the, to assure everyone that it's not actually true that there was a resolution forbidding animals leaving inside. It's necessary since the pigs are the uh, brains of the farm for them to have a quiet place to work. So instead of living in the uh, barn, they, they start, um, uh, sorry, living in the, um, an, where animals live, they, uh, they actually go into the place where Mr. Johns used to live. So this was something uh, they, they are not supposed to do. So animals were convinced by a uh, squealer telling that this was necessary because uh, pigs need more quiet place to work because they are the brain of the farm. Referring to Napoleon as the leader, Squealer also insists that it's more dignified for Napoleon to live in a house. Despite Squealer's insistences, some animals are disturbed to learn that the pigs eat in the kitchen and sleep in the beds. So these are actually part of the commandments uh, they shouldn't do those things uh, boxer brushes his this off so while some animals felt bad that the uh, pigs are doing this boxer brushes this off but clover remembers that there was a rule against sleeping in beds she asked muriel to read her the commandment about beds to confirm but it now reads that no animal will sleep in bed with sheets. So they have actually corrected it. Uh, and when they read it is like you shouldn't sleep on bed with sheets. Clover doesn't remember this. But since it is in writing, she reasons that it must have always been this way. So Clover doesn't remember it, it, it being in that way. But she somehow when she saw it as written, she believes that it must be like that. Uh, Squealer accompanies by a few dogs, passes by and helps put things in a perspective, perspective for Clover. He points out that there never was a ruling against beds. So this is what Squealer does. Uh, since the word bed just refers to the place to she uh, sleep, sheets are the problem as they are a human invention. 
he assures Glover that the beds are only a, as comfortable as they need, and the pigs need their sleep since they need to keep their wits about them. If they don't, Mr. Johns might return. Knowing that Mr. Johns' return would be disastrous, the animals agree with Squealer and say nothing when days later the pigs announce that they'll get up an hour later than everyone else. So that's another change that comes into the uh, routine. Like they'll be waking up late. The animals are tired but happy when fall arrives. The stores of food for the winter are low after the sale of the hay and corn. But the windmill is almost halfway done and the bolsters, um, that bolsters their spirits. After the harvest, the animals dedicate themselves to building up the walls of the windmill. Boxer even spends hours at night working alone and everyone except Benjamin spends their spare time admiring the structure. In November, however, a storm blows through. One morning, the animals wake and see that the windmill is in ruins. They run, they run to the windmill and mournfully look at the fallen stone. Napoleon rushes to the site and snuffles around sharply. He suddenly stops and quietly says that Snowball came in and at night and destroyed the windmill. Napoleon sentences Snowball to death and announces rewards to anyone who captures him. They discover pig prints leading to a hole in the hedge near Foxwood and Napoleon declares that they are snowballs. He cries that they must build all winter to show snowball up. Now let's move on to chapter 7. Uh, so the winter is bitter and cold. But animals toil on the windmill knowing that the humans will be thrilled if they don't finish it uh, on time. So the, they don't want to be uh, made uh, fools or rather they don't want the humans to think that they are not successful. Uh, yeah, The humans spitefully pretend that the windmill fell because the walls were too thin, not because of snowball. The animals know better, but they decide to build three foot thick walls just in case if they have another um, storm coming. Uh, snow stops their progress for a while and the animals struggle to feel hopeful. Squealer gives many speeches in the uh, on the dignity of labor, but the animals find more inspiration in boxer. In January... Rations are reduced when they discover that potatoes went bad. The animals don't have much to eat and fear they'll starve to death. But they conceal this from the outside world. Napoleon devises strategies to make it seem to Mr. Wimper that there is a lot of food. Near the end of January, Napoleon recognizes that he has to find grain somewhere. He spent most of the time in the farmhouse guarded by the fierce dogs. When he occasionally comes out, it's a ceremonious affair and the dogs surround him. Squealer conducts the Sunday meetings. One morning, he announces that the hens will need to surrender their eggs. Napoleon entered into contract to trade 400 eggs per week for enough grain to support them until summer. The hens are enraged as they all plan to raise uh, spring chicks, so they rebel. Hens lay eggs in the rafters at first, but Napoleon cuts their rations. The rebellion lasts five days, during which time nine hens die before the hens give up. Napoleon insists that the nine hens died of disease. Rumors circulate that Snowball is hiding at Foxwood or Finchweed, while Napoleon's relationship with both farms improve. Animal Farm has a pile of timber that Mr. Wimper suggests selling, and both Mr. Pilkington and Mr. Frederick went to buy it. Napoleon deliberates in his decision to sell, and 
Whenever it seems he is close to selling to one farmer, rumors fly that snowball is on that farmer's farm and he changes his mind. Early in the spring, the animals discover with horror that snowball has been sneaking in onto the farm. He supposedly comes in nightly, uh, comes in nightly to trample eggs and steal, and the animals begin to blame everything wrong or, or upset on snowball. This continues even when the animals find the key to the store shed, which Snowball supposedly threw down a well under a sack of meal. Napoleon announces an investigation into Snowball's activities. He and his dogs tour the farm, finding evidence of Snowball's scent everywhere. This frightens everyone. One evening, Squealer calls the animals to tell them that they have discovered everything, uh, something terrible. Snowball sold himself to Mr. Frederick and Pinchfield and he plans to lead their attack on Animal Farm. Further, Snowball was in league with Mr. Johns all along, which they know because of newly discovered documents. Squealer insists that Snowball attempts to destroy them or all at the Battle of the Cowshed makes sense now. The animals are dumbfounded as most of them remember that Snowball fought valiantly for them and that Mr. Johns shot Snowball. So it's hard for them to believe that Snowball was a traitor. Boxer questions this and shares his recollection of events but Squealer insists he is mistaken. They have, in Snowball's own writing, which Boxer unfortunately cannot read, that Snowball was going to give them all away. His plot would have succeeded if Napoleon hadn't leapt at Mr. John's crying, Death to Humanity, and bit Mr. John's leg. This graphic description helps the animals remember that Squealer's recollection is the correct one. But Boxer uneasily says that he still thinks that Snowball was on their side at the Battle of Cowshed. Firmly, Squealer insists that, according to Napoleon, Snowball was in league with Mr. Johns long before the rebellion took place. This satisfies Boxer since Napoleon said it. But Squealer gives him an ugly look as he tells the animals to keep an eye uh, out for Snowball's secret agents who are all over the farm. Four days later, Napoleon orders the animals to assemble in the yard and emerges from the farmhouse, wearing both his first and second class animal hero medals and surrounded by the dogs. The animals cower as Napoleon whimpers. The dogs drag the four young pigs to the front and three dogs leap at Boxer. Boxer slings them aside and pins one before looking at Napoleon for what to do next. Napoleon tells Boxer to let the terrified dog go. The four pigs are the same ones that protested when Napoleon did away with the Sunday meeting and they confess crimes without hesitation. They say that they have been working with Snowball and planned to help him give Animal Farm to Frederick. They also collaborate that they also corroborate that Snowball worked with Mr. Johns. So these animals were so frightened that they confess everything. When they they are done, the dogs tear their throat out, so they are killed by the dogs. Napoleon asks who else has something to confess. Three hens confess that in a dream, Snowball told them to disobey. Uh, disobey Napoleon. A goose confesses to stealing corn and a sheep confesses that they urinated in drinking pool on Snowball's orders. Others confess crimes and Napoleon slaughters them all. When it's all over, the other animals sink away, unsure which is more shocking, the fact that the dead animals were in league with Snowball or their punishment. This is the first time since Mr. John's departure that there has been bloodshed on the farm. 
The animals, except for the cat, who disappeared, lie down together near the windmill while Boxer paces. Boxer announces that he wouldn't have believed that this could happen on Animal Farm. But it must have happened because they are at fault. He was to get up an hour earlier and promptly rushes to the quarry. Clover and the other animals remain by the windmill. They look out over Animal Farm and remember that they own all of it. Tia fill Clover's eyes and through her, though she can't formulate her thoughts, if she could, uh, she'd think that this was in the goal when they rebelled. Her idea of the future was animals free from abuse and hunger, working together, the strong protecting the weak. Instead, now nobody can speak their mind. Dogs growl and they have to watch their friends be uh, killed for confessing to awful crimes. She doesn't think of rebellion or disobedience. However, as she still recognizes that this is better than Mr. Johnson's return would be, She'll accept Napoleon's leadership, even if this wasn't what she hoped for. Clover begins to sing Beasts of England, and the other animals join and sing it mournfully. When they finish their third time through, Squealer and two dogs arrive and announce that Beasts of England has been abolished. Stiffly, he explains that it's no longer necessary since the rebellion ended earlier with the execution of the traitors. The society portrayed in Beasts of England is now established, so the song is useless. The animals are frightened and some consider protesting, but the sheep begin to bleat. Four legs good, two legs bad. And this end any discussion. This ends any discussion. Minimus composes a song that begins Animal Farm, Animal Farm. Never through me shalt thou come to harm. For most animals, this new song doesn't measure up to Beasts of England. So, uh, everything is getting replaced and uh, Beasts of England, which, which represented a, a great feeling for the animals, the song itself was re, uh, replaced by uh, the pigs. So, these are the uh, four chapters that we are uh, learning uh, in this video. Um, after this video, we'll, we'll have another video on the next three chapters. Um, so, we have seen that unlike the three chapters, the first three chapters in which we have um, a, a, a kind of utopian uh, place where everything is good. We have everything being um, turned into uh, the opposite in, in, the, in these four chapters. The pigs uh, come into power. They change the whole, um, the the ten, uh, the seven commandments. Uh, then uh, the animals are forced to obey them, and things are worse actually. But they don't dare to tell it to the world. So uh, let's watch the next video for the rest of the novel. Thank you for watching.